uh, Seth Beyond You is uh, going to be our, our next presenter. Um, uh, he's presenting to us about uh, the development of a physics based model for high power peristaltic magnetic nozzle. This is a, a fusion concept, very interesting. Uh, comes to us from Felicity Space in partnership with Caltech and University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, Seth, uh, you have the con. You're on mute before you start, just so you know. Thank you very much, Sonny. Um, can I share my screen? Um, can you see this? Yes, we got it full screen. Great. Um, how do I minimize? Yes. Minimize that. Yeah, we can't we can't see the any sometimes the video thumbnail from Zoom stays over there. We can't see that. So oh okay. Yeah, that because I was seeing the thumbnails and trying to get rid of it. Yeah. Okay, great. Um so thank you, Sonny. Uh, thank you everyone for, for attending this um, um, briefing. And um, I'm happy to represent the Helicity Space Corporation um, collaborating with uh, Caltech um, and the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I'd like to thank uh, the Miller Space Institute for supporting this work. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and um, the Department of Energy for also supporting a portion of this work. Um, all this actually is part of a larger uh, project and collaboration um, with academic uh, uh, academia and national labs uh, to develop this new fusion concept that we call the Helicity Drive. Um, and uh, this work here is really um, uh, supported by Limitless Space Institute um, for developing a portion of it, which is um, the modeling of the magnetic nozzle, uh, magnetic uh, peristaltic magnetic nozzle uh, portion. So the project team here um, is mainly uh, the Caltech team. So Professor Paul Bellin um, there is helping us with, with uh, the magnetic nozzle design and concept. Um, he invented this in the, in the 1970s. Um, uh, Seth Pre is his uh, uh, postdoc um, working, working on the calculations. And then Professor Carlos Romero Talamas is um, the mechanical engineer at UMBC who's um, helping us with the hardware design um, and his new graduate student, uh, Natalia Marion, has been fantastic at um, um, building, fabricating, and, and uh, testing. We've also had the help of senior undergrads in their final uh, design uh, 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 projects, and they've been extremely, extremely useful and uh, very, very helpful. Um, it's amazing to have such a great team. So <clears throat> the basis of the of the uh, whole project is really this new fusion propulsion concept, which we call for short the helicity drive. Um, I'll explain uh, a little bit later why it's called helicity. It's a pulse magneto inertial fusion concept. Um, so it's aimed primarily for a space propulsion and power system uh, rather than terrestrial power plant. Um, from the ground up. So when we conceived of the of the of the concept, um, we try to think ahead as to how to apply it for a system that is as light as possible. Um, and as Kelvin mentioned, uh, as high a specific power as possible, um, given, given what we know today. Um, we exploit three uh, key ideas, um, A, B, and C. Uh, something we call magnetic plectronemes to confine the plasma that's been newly discovered in the laboratory. Um, we use magnetic reconnection um, to preheat the plasma. So when we merge, um, a number of these plectronemes, they, they preheat the plasma to, to high temperatures, which reduces the uh, actual compression ratio required to raise the energy density to fusion condition. So if you do all run through all the calculations, you get the triple product that scales um, uniquely with a number of objects that merge at the beginning. So n to the raise to the power three halves in this case. <clears throat> um, so that's quite different from um, all other uh, prior fusion concepts, because the triple product now has an extra control knob um, operational parameter, in addition to the usual, you know, plasma current, magnetic field, plasma size, and compression ratio for many inertial fusion systems. Um, and the idea is um, you can roughly compensate a little bit for uncertainties in the confinement time. You know, as you scale up, you can have more guns instead. Also, you spread the input energy um, uh, over n guns, so the energy density per gun. Uh, can remain constant uh, effectively. 
And it also means that we could potentially accelerate the development path of this constant because it's analogous to cylinders in the car engine. Instead of increasing the size of a single cylinder, um, you, uh, you can use the same cylinder and put those in, in parallel effectively. So the, the, the philosophy why we're also aiming for fusion propulsion concept is that really any fusion concept, at some point you need to get net gain. Um, but what can you do when you get net gain? Now, the idea is that even with modest net gain, you should still be able to push a spacecraft. It might not be the most efficient, the best uh, propulsion system in the world uh, or ever. However, we, it would be a fusion propulsion system. Um, that's even before you achieve sufficient gain to be able to recirculate some of the power to to um, to make it self-sustaining, you know, which is the goal of a power plant. At that point, you need very large gains to recoup all the inefficiencies of the, of the subsystems. So the idea is let's try and aim for a minimum viable uh, fusion propulsion engine. Um, and according to these basic calculations, the performance is very similar to um, existing calculations for nuclear electric propulsion. So in the, in the comparison with other, other rocket uh, propulsion, the specific thrust, um, which is key for going fast, um, and a specific impulse, which is key for being fuel efficient. Um, ideally, of course, you want to be on the top right. So things like inertial confinement fusion is on the top right. Um, Kelvin you know, showed that you can have very, very large specific powers at high specific impulse. Um, Magneto-inertial fusion and magnetic fusion, which is direct, steady state, and self-sustained, is roughly on the, on the middle right, which, which is great. But the question is, how small can you go? Um, so in the concept where you just use electricity on board, um, make a short fusion pulse, and then inject it out the back, you know recirculation of power or anything like that, and you have the same uh, electrical power input, um, the helicity or the, the, the fusion propulsion system is effectively an augmented uh, electric propulsion system, and the performance is roughly similar to uh, 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 nuclear electric propulsion. Now, as the gains go up, so you go to larger and larger uh, engines, <clears throat> you can start recirculating some of the power, absorb some of the, some of the heat, turn a turbo, turn, turbo electric generator um, or direct electric conversion or something like that, make electricity to supplement the in onboard electricity, the input power. At that point, you really start to get more than what you put in um, and it becomes very interesting until eventually you reach the blue stage where you can recirculate all the power and it's completely self-sustained and then you are in the in the top right but the key idea for this concept is that we can scale reasonably easily from these kind of kilowatt levels of uh, thrust power all the way to gigawatt levels of thrust power simply with the same um plasma gun and just increase the number of plasma guns that, that's really the the key for the rapid development of this concept now there's, there's of course been lots and lots of different fusion concepts and what's so different about this one why why is it new and why do we focus on this one um uh, there's three reasons really um we like magnetic inertial fusion because it's it's roughly <clears throat> um a goldilocks approach in terms of um confinement time versus the density of the of the, of the plasma um to reach to reach uh, the lawson criterion um, for magnetic confinement fusion is steady state um, which by the physics definition of steady state is that the time to heat the plasma has to be much larger than the energy confinement time. Um, so most of the input energy is, is lost out and you're, you're fighting electron confinement time. And the only way to really increase tau is to increase the size of the machine. That's, you know, or increase the magnetic field strength and so on and so on, but effectively increase the size of the machine. So you're going vertically up at a given constant density. Um, Inertial confinement fusion um, is the opposite. Basically, you don't really care about the, the confinement time itself. You just have to be able to compress everything on much shorter timescales. So basically, you need very, very large input powers um, for a given energy. Um, and you know, basically, what you're doing is you're increasing um, the density to the right, so you're on the horizontal horizontal line. Magneto-inertial fusion is somewhere in the middle. You, you want to be able to compress roughly on some kind of energy confinement time. Um, now you can call it magnetic inertial or or um, or uh, or um, magnetized target fusion. It depends whether you're on one side of the confinement time or the other. Um, but roughly, you're supposed to be a bit more efficient um, um, in terms of the input energy compared to to the other two. Now, 
because of that, in principle, um, we have reduced reactor size and cost, reduced magnet size and cost, um, reduced driver um, size and cost. So in principle, it should be uh, cheaper and simplified engineering. So um, you know, the, the, this curve in the middle shows the fusion system, prospective fusion system cost versus the actual fusion density. Um, and magnetic inertial fusion is, is um, you know, somewhere uh, along the minimum. Our concept is a little bit more dense um, due to physics reasons, um, but we're still, in principle, should be more compact and smaller and uh, cheaper than, than the large um, state-of-the-art fusion uh, system. Um, now, in terms of fusion propulsion concepts uh, specifically, um, one thing we can do is compare the specific thrust power predicted by all the various concepts um, as a function of the density that, that uh, these, uh, the horizontal axis for all these three uh, charts is density. And um, steady state are the black circles, um, pulse systems are the gray circles, and then the radius of the circle is roughly the, the, the size and the mass of the, of the uh, fusion concept. And you can see that the steady state ones are reasonably large, are hundreds of tons to thousands of tons for the various fusion propulsion concepts. There's a couple of them that, that uh, claim to, like the colliding beam um, FRC, uh, claim to have you know, tens of tons. The uh, laser fusion uh, ICF ones um, are very large, um, tens of thousands of tons, um, and they're very high densities on the right of the uh, system. Now the pulse systems, um, and magnet magnetized target fusion and so on are, are somewhere in the middle, but they're reasonably heavy. Um, they, they, they've, got, they've got large masses. Now, one thing which is uh, uh, interesting is also the pulse rate, is that for ICF or a lot of magnetized target fusion concepts, they assume tens of hertz or hundreds of hertz um, pulse rate. In our concept, um, we assume about one hertz if it's self-sustained. Um, to try and make it as uh, simple as possible. It's going to be a trade-off between the pulse frequency um, and the amount of heat that you produce um, and the power, um, thrust power that you would get out of it. Um, at the lower, so the green and the red uh, values where you have very small engines and no recirculating power and so on, you're limited by the input auxiliary power charging the capacitive banks. And at that point, the pulse rate is actually very, very low. Um, so this is the way we, we, we do the calculation and we scale up the fusion performance. Um, there's effectively just three classes of engine we call small, medium, large. Um, and effectively the fusion augmented electric propulsion system where you have some auxiliary power, um, you generate um, uh, electricity, uh, the plasma and then the plasma um, will um, um, be raised to fusion uh, energy conditions and um, energy density conditions and then um, converted to thrust. Um, there's no recirculation of power. That's the simplest if you want fusion propulsion system you can have. Um, that's the green green curve, um, scaling with the number of guns, and you don't get a huge amount of fusion power because the pulse rate is really, really low. Um, however, you know you can think of it if you put 100 kilowatt electric in, you get roughly 50-ish kilowatt thrust out, um, and then the rest is in, in radiation um, heat. So it, it's not too bad. And then you just increase the number of guns, increase the size of the engine, um, and then you get this, this um, n to the three half scaling of the, the power output. Now, once the power output is sufficiently large that adding extra power conversion systems is worth the extra mass, then at that point, you can recirculate some of the power and then you really start to get um, much more thrust uh, out. And that, that shows this really uh, steep increase in the, in the red curves in terms of propulsive power output. The M uh, design point effectively reflects and shows where um, it, the extra mass is worth, is worth, the, um, worth, worth it, basically. And then, of course, um, as the power conversion system recirculates, is sufficient to self-sustain the whole engine. You don't need the input power whatsoever. It's just a backup, backup system. And at that point, you're fully self-sustained. And then we're very similar to, to other uh, fusion concepts. Um, all these calculations are done with various conservative assumptions, pragmatic assumptions, and, and some optimistic assumptions, um, which are often based on, on um, uh, experimental data as well. Um, these are the potential uh, mission level figures or merit. Um, you know, the, the smallest ones are really designed to demonstrate that uh, a fusion propulsion system can work. 
um, is it going to be competitive with respect to to state of the art um, propulsion systems? We don't know yet, but but um, you know th these calculations and this project will help uh, refine some of the subsystem numbers. The medium ones, um, you know, we think that um, for a cis lunar uh, freight cycler um, would be would be very useful. It won't be very fast, but it can be very fuel efficient in terms of taking heavy payloads um, on the reuse reusable um, cycling uh, trajectories. Um, for for near term reason meaning near term missions, but the large and self sustained one, of course, are the ones which would be very interesting for many um, high energy missions, in particular interstellar missions. Um, you know, within a hundred years, the largest engine in principle could um, could reach Alpha Centauri in a flyby uh, mission, assuming it would accelerate uh, uh, nonstop. So that's really probably at the limit of what our concept could do in terms of the engine, unless we seriously optimize some of the subsystems. These are reasonably conservative um, uh, numbers. Um, some people want to know exactly how the helicity drive works. Um, the, these are the four steps. So it's a four stroke engine, if you want. Um, we take plasmas, um, in a n number of plasmas at the beginning, um, merge them together under helicity conservation and magnetic energy uh, dissipated into heat. Um, we form another single plasma object um, that, that is hotter. <clears throat> um, and then you compress it using this peristaltic magnetic field that, um, that I will get to and talk about um, as part of this project. And then you can see how the triple product scales um, and with a number of platinums um, and the various density ratios. And there's a comparison with a shear flow Z-pinch um, to show that we can reach similar triple products, but with less uh, compression. Um, because of uh, the preheating. Um, it's pulsed operation. Um, I want to highlight this is not a steady state, you know, a thrust system is really pulsed magneto inertial fusion system, which operates in the uh, formation stage, the merging stage, the compression stage, and then the exhaust. In the exhaust, you mix it with, um, with um, propellant to, to increase the thrust and reduce the specific impulse. Um, there is a physics basis um, behind all this. Um, the plectronemes, so we talked about A, B, and C. The plectronemes was discovered in the laboratory um, in two experiments, um, independently and separately. Uh, the Mochi experiment at the University of Washington and the SSX experiment at uh, Swarthmore. Um, the, the two key difference, SSX discovered these plectronemes first that were predicted um, back in the 80s, theoretically, as the re end result of a tilting spheromac. Um, a spheromac is are uh, tilt unstable. <clears throat> so you need a very close fitting walls flux on server to be able to stabilize um, these spheromax. If you start playing with the aspect ratio um, and the, the distance of the walls to, to the spheromax, the spheromax will want to tilt. So most people would, would abandon the idea of looking at spheromax once it's tilted. Um, SSX continued looking at what happened to the spheromax after it tilted and saw that the theoretical prediction um, turned out to be correct and you get a twisted double helix uh, uh, rubber band um, uh, instead of a single torus. But it was compact. Um, it still, it was, it, at that point, it was self stable, <laughs> completely stable, um, still had nested flux surfaces, rotational transform. And because it's tilted already, it doesn't go any further. And uh, it has a very long aspect ratio because you can stretch now to very, very long, uh, long lengths. Um, Mochi uh, discovered the same thing um, serend uh, serendipitously, um, this time, but without any close fitting walls. Um, it's really in a self stable jet that you can think uh, resembles an astrophysical jet coming out from an accretion disk. And um, we observed this double helix that, that confines a plasma in a very stable fashion over hundreds of Alton times. Um, it's stable to the king, stable to the sausage, and, and all these uh, stabilities. Um, Reconnection heating has been experimentally observed in the laboratory um, for compact toruses merging together, spheromax, FRC, spherical tokamaks, um, and also SSX has measured uh, plectonium reconnection um, heating as well. Um, and this is the database, the worldwide database of um, temperature, ion temperature as a function of the dissipated magnetic energy, a uh, magnetic field. Um, in, in these experiments. Now, Mochi only had one, one plectronium, so there's no merging, but we're planning to, we're building uh, an experiment to actually uh, test this merging with up to four uh, of these, of these plectronemes. Um, the reconnection heating is really attractive because it's very high power. Um, it's very efficient um, and it's a direct heating of ions and it's internal and you don't need perfect geometry. 
um, compared to things like compression heating, where you need ideally the perfect implosion. Um, and directly heating the ions has, brings a, a lot of advantages. Now, peristaltic compression is something that uh, Paul Bellin uh, invented in the 70s, where you would have a tapered set of coils. And this is what, we, what we've built. And this um, uh, animation that you see is the result of the code uh, coming out from this project, actually. The advantage for this compression is compared to things like um, um, a liner compression, there's no moving parts. Um, so you can control the pulse rate um, more easily. Um, it's constant energy, so you don't have to increase um, the uh, currents in the coils and the steady state um, um, set of coils um, with constant geometry. Um, and it's a simplified geometry and it's eminently suitable to a propulsion system. Um, so that, of course, uh, like any new concept, there's quite a lot of uncertainties um, and we'll really talk about the physics on, and the details of the compression. Um, there's also uh, a, a larger program uh, that the company is working on to be able to uh, look at the engineering and the business side, um, but the physics of course being, being key. It's, it's um, you know, we're, we're in this phase right now, phase one, um, which is um, building the Eclair experiment, which is a, 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 a uh, subsequent to all the previous experiments and results uh, that were done at all these various institutions that we worked in uh, and um, to bring all these all these uh, concepts together. Now, the, the magnetic nozzle is clearly important because um, there's a trade-off to be done between the compression ratio that we need um, and, uh, and the number of guns that we have. The triple product scaling here, you can see, so the N triple product scaling compared to the initial triple product it scales with the number of guns to the three half, some of the reconnection specifications, and then the compression ratio raised to some power um, and the compression scheme C uh, effectively. So that, that's roughly the, the scaling of the triple product. And a lower compression ratio means that we can get, have a greater range of specific power, um, but a higher compression ratio means that we can have a lower number of uh, input guns basically. Um, so the, the, that's the, the trade-off that we need to do. Um, these basic calculations, of course, need more realistic considerations for uh, the nozzle design, uh, inductances, mutual inductances, and so all these things um, that has been part of this project and, and has resulted uh, from this. Um, the, the compression scheme was published in 1979 by Paul Bellin and um, demonstrated on a little tabletop device uh, that was about 50 centimeters long, um, maybe 100 joules of, of energy, just, just a little system that would sit on the table on the bench. Um, just to show, and he measured the magnetic field uh, along the axis of this tapered uh, set, and um, it compared re compared well with uh, with that system uh, calculation. So what we do, what we're doing basically is we want to be able to scale this to kilojoule systems, and we're building it, um, and then later eventually scale it all the way up to a megajoule system, and then coupling it to to the actual plasma itself. Um, and um, there are various free parameters when uh, in the inputs. So really, it's the number of coils that you want to choose, the radius of the coils, and the shape um, of the of the uh, the tapers, um, the number of turns per coil, and then the compression scheme itself. That exponent raised to the power um, c is a um, uh, a choice that we can have, which determines how the coils are arranged, um, and you can choose them um, to either compress at a constant flux a constant geometry or a constant effectively uh, perpendicular temperature to parallel temperature, like, the, like in the mirror ratio, um, or a constant um, length. So that's, that's purely a radio compression only. That's very similar to a z-pinch, uh, which is c equal to. So in fact, these calculations, um, when we um, put the c equal to and compare it to the, to the flow through z-pinch compression scheme, um, we get exactly the same numbers that they do. So. Um, and then the output is then the uh, position separation of the coils. Um, and then we get the scaling of magnetic field, the scaling of the mirror, um, the dips, um, so the hollow and the, the ends um, between the two, the two peak and then the volume uh, compression ratio. At the start of the project, we, we were quite ambitious. We want to do a density ratio of about 100 or so just to be able to um, cover, cover our backs. Um, right now, we probably have to be um, less ambitious and go for uh, probably a compression ratio of 40, at least 10, um, a factor of 10 um, would, be, would be ideal. The reason we had to reduce it basically is because of the voltages. To go to a density compression ratio of 100 in a very short time scale would need um, megavolts of, of, uh, 
of a voltage, um, we weren't too confident in operating in megavolts, so we, we probably have to reduce that density compression. Um, the design formalism, really, this is the key chart <clears throat> in terms of how to design this, this uh, magnetic nozzle. These are the inputs that we have. Um, we can choose. Um, we can change these numbers, so we, we, we iterate it many, many times to be able to reach these numbers that were a trade-off balance between feasibility in the lab um, in terms of what we want to build um, and um, uh, the output numbers, which would be the magnetic field ratio and density, com density ratio compared to these. Um, the uh, circuit characteristics are then um, modeled out from these uh, input numbers, the shape of the coils, the number of the coils, um, the kind of field that we want. Um, these are the equations for the circuit equations for this uh, transmission line, effectively, um, including all the mutual inductances um, uh, and the capacitances and resistors and with the termination resistor, um, and given some kind of input, uh, input pulse. So these equations effectively then output your circuit characteristics, so your, your time scale, your LC time scale, um, and then the velocity of the pulse traveling through these uh, transmission lines. And that we have to compare to our experimental results and the simulations to be able to see what kind of time scales and velocities for these pulses we need, from which we get out uh, the capacitances that are required, the peak voltages, the peak currents, and the stored energy that we have for the given magnetic field that we want. Um, the, these outputs have been iterated over a long period of time to be able to get to some numbers that we're comfortable with. Um, so right now, tens of 15 kilovolts is something we can build and operate in the lab. Um, with uh, kiloamps of current, that's fine, and about 10 kilojoules of uh, energy, um, which is an order of magnitude, um, two orders of magnitude greater than the tabletop uh, device that we have. We started to build the hardware. Um, so this wasn't directly part of the project, but it's a great output of the project um, and that we're, we're funding internally, um, is to be able to build the nozzle themselves, uh, test it, stress test it on the bench first, and then eventually integrate it into the Eclair experiment. Um, the output is being coupled to the plasma simulations um, that are being done with Los Alamos uh, National Lab. The project with the plasma simulations um, has ended, um, but we just received um, um, uh, a new grant from the Department of Energy to continue and expand the simulations uh, for the next two years. Um, and uh, we're including not only MHD simulations, but we're also going to go into particle and cell simulations and then coupling the results of the output of this code um, and then back and forth and iterate with these two. So this is this is really nice and, and ongoing. Um, and it's one of the fantastic results of this project was the output was convincing um, so that the DOE and peer reviewers would allow us to, to continue working, collaborating with Los Alamos to, to, to refine the concept. Um, some of the realistic considerations that we are, that the code um, has allowed us to look into is uh, the effect of mutual inductance between all these coils and finite um, and dispersion effects um, in, in this uh, realistic uh, system, which um, we, we assume the scaling of the magnetic field with axial position under compression as a, a WKB scaling, um, but three, of course the simulations three, are right there. Three minutes, Seth, uh, sorry. Oh, sure. Sorry. Oh, well, maybe I should speak faster like <laughs> Kevin does. Um, yeah, so you can see that uh, basically, depending on the type of input pulse, the width um, and the separation and the timing and the amplitude and so on, uh, for realistic mutual inductances, um, clearly you can see that the outputting magnetic field is not as great as uh, maybe back up 10 lower than the uh, WKB uh, projections. But this code really allows us to, um, to be able to uh, design and iteratively design the, the, the electrical systems um, to try and see which, um, which system we want. Um, we, we've already started fabricating. We've, we've settled in on the design of the coils um, and uh, literally started building and cutting and um, assembling the coils and doing test assemblies and so on. Um, right now, not in vacuum yet, but these coils will go into vacuum. The support structures like the, these uh, brackets and then the, the the arms um, rails um, will be modified right now they're just uh, plywood but at the moment um, um, we come across some issues you know typical of any fabrication um, things like ceramic washers break um, you know like one out of ten ceramic washers break so we have to make sure we're more reliable in doing that 
Um, these copper coils are designed to be bitter, um, a bitter design to be able to take some of the large fields um, on a short time scale that they can warp um, sometimes, especially the large ones. So we have to redesign them with more, more fixes. Um, and then some of these 3D printed H brackets, um, and they break. So we're doing the PLA and higher inlet density. When we assemble them all together, it looks, uh, it looks fantastic because this is eventually what we'll go into a vacuum chamber. Um, and then we'll be able to shoot the plasma through it and then observe this compression um, through that. And this is really, uh, the length of it is about uh, 60 centimeters. Uh, no, sorry, about a meter, a meter uh, long. The total mass is about six kilos. The total energy we're putting in is about nine, 10 kilo, oh, kilojoules. So the specific mass um, is about 0.7 kilograms per kilojoule, which actually compares well to all the uh, specific power that calculations that we did earlier, the back on the envelope calculations we did earlier where we estimated about um, about a kilogram per kilogram um, for, for these coils, um, all the way up to the large and extra large um, fusion, self-sustained fusion propulsion system. Um, this is literally what we're building. This CAD drawing and rendering um, is literally based on uh, the engineering drawings of, um, of the systems and subsystems, the vacuum chambers, um, and everything that we're going to be putting into this. It's actually under construction. Um, where, where um, um, you know, as you see in the coils, where this will be made um, um, uh, in a private company, um, and um, we're going to be assembling all this and putting it together and hoping for first plasma uh, this time next year. Um, we're coupling to plasma simulations. These are the um, preliminary ideal MHD simulations to be able to show these plasma jets coming out, um, merging together. Um, within this coil system and then coupling into the coil, uh, coil designs. Um, these were uh, the simulations just to, to overlay um, uh, roughly what, what it looks like. And then we're actually in the middle of designing the, the double pulse um, 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 uh, drivers. Um, there's two, two ways of doing it, either pulse, as a pulse forming network or two separate capacity banks that we're going to fire uh, separately. Uh, they have advantages and disadvantages, each of them. We're going to build a bench test version first of both uh, designs, literally test it, and even with a waveform generator uh, to be able to control these input pulse shapes. Um, so the project is really successful um, and moving towards this, uh, this eclair experiment. We built these realistic codes. Um, we started to build hardware. These results really helped us uh, close some fundraising for building uh, the eclair experiment and obtain this new DOE grant for continuing expanding the simulation to Los Alamos. Uh, there's been issues that we've been working on, mechanical and electrical ones, um, and we're working on those and addressing them uh, one by one. And it's been, it's been um, uh, a revelation. Um, we're writing up the manuscripts for uh, submission to peer reviewed journals and documenting everything into a final report. Um, the successful collaboration um, between HST Space, Caltech, and UNBC is continued now with internal funding to finish this fabrication, um, finish the simulations, and integrate it with, uh, with Eclair. Um, so with that, thank you very much. Um, and uh, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, profit from these unprecedented benefits of the concept. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Seth. Uh, fantastic job on the presentation. Before you stop sharing, could you go back to slide 22? Sure. Just wanted to give you an opportunity to show the people the, you know, the amazing animation there and just go ahead and press oh. play. <laughs> The thing of beauty so this is really preliminary. We're still uh, uh, working on the simulations um, and coupling it to the plasmas. Um, and some, you know, the, it goes unstable at the end. Uh, yeah. So that's one thing that we have to we have to look at. It's stable at the beginning up to about there, and then after once it merges, it goes unstable. Um, this is what you got from the LANL code, right? Correct. Yes, this is a simulation of the Los Alamos code, uh, MHD simulation. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Thank. Thank you for that. I just wanted to. Uh, check that. And then uh, I would, um, <clears throat> on the lighter uh, note, uh, I'd, I'd like to encourage you to um, build on your acronym legacy of using the acronym ECLAIR. Uh, I would, uh, ECLAIR, I think you should have SCONE or, and or FRITTER as one of your future iterations. So find some Excellent. way to you. Yeah. work that into. Uh, we'll we'll try and keep that in mind. Yeah, absolutely. D a desert, desert based uh, fusion propulsion system. Right, 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 right. So, okay, you can uh, stop sharing your screen. Uh, we can open it up to uh, questions. Eclair also means lightning in French. Ah, okay. All right. I'm just taking the 
the savage American interpretation of it. You're, you're, you have a much more noble view of it, right? I'm like, <laughs> well, why don't we use Schritter? That sounds like a good acronym. <laughs> well, it does look like an eclair as well because it's like the, the soft parts are surrounded by the... <laughs> right, right, good stuff, good stuff. Uh, what kind of questions we got from the panelists? While they're thinking, I do have one. Uh, oh, I, uh, Piero, sorry, Mr. Yang, go ahead, sir. You got to unmute yourself. Uh, I have a just a small question, a short one. May I? Oh, yes. Go ahead. May I? Uh, you go ahead and ask your question. Yes. Yes. The, <clears throat> now, in the previous talk, Kelvin's pointed out the the physical principles of the absence of the scaling variance is very important. So then it, you showed us um, a model uh, 15 centimeter long, right? Am I right or something like that? I think you can point one of the slides. So my overall questions, are there critical length scales of your device, or a minimal or a maximal for, for it to work? Because your calculation estimates will depend on critical lens case, depending on the um, on the intensity of the fields, uh, uh, so the, the state, the stability of the, of, uh, of the plasma state, I think does depend on these lens scales. So, so your device has to to be between an upper and a lower lens scale, I assume. So just to have an idea, so what do we expect concretely? Because you have also a picture with a human. Um, I, think broke up. I think we i think we lost uh piero there um uh, could you could you glean what he was saying and then answer the question otherwise we'll just go on to the next one sure. so uh it's a good, great question so the question um is about length scales um, um and in terms is there how what is the impact of the length scales um on the concept and the scaling up to to a fusion a fusion system so it's a great question now from an MHD point of view, um, you know, as long as you fit the dimensionless numbers, you can scale it up. Um, but in a realistic system, length scales become become very important. Um, now, in this case here, we rely on um, uh, holistic conservation principles, where the dimensions uh, are critical. Um, so, in this case here, um, the plectonym shape of the plasma, the double helix, is very similar to a Taylor state. It is the Taylor state, in fact like a spheromac and so on. And it all depends on the aspect ratio of your volume, the cylindrical volume that surrounds the plasma. And that cylindrical aspect ratio um, has to be larger, an aspect ratio of larger than um, 1.67, effectively. If that uh, cylindrical aspect ratio is longer, we have the plectonemic Taylor state. If it's shorter than 1.67, then a spheromac is a minimum energy state. So then you get back into a torus situation, which is why there was that transition. If a, if a spheromac is left on its own, i.e. the aspect ratio is larger than 1.67, then the spheromac will tilt because it wants to go to a lower energy state. And that low energy state is then confined in the cylinder to be a double helix, effectively. Now, let's work backwards from a fusion, uh, a magneto inertial fusion system. At the most compressed state, which is the smallest plasma possible, we still want it to be a plectonym. Therefore, that aspect ratio has to be 1.67 or larger. That's where we start off from. And then what we do is then that has to be a fusion system, a fusion energy conditions, and then you expand it out. So this is the comp magnetic compression system and expand it out back to the plasma guns at the formation region. And the formation region is based on our experimental result, our past experimental results. In our past experimental results, we formed a one meter long uh, plasma that had a plectodium inside it with an aspect ratio of about 25 to 1. We've also done that with an aspect ratio of 3 to 1. So we know that at least between 3 to 1 and 25 to 1, we can get these plectonemes. And the idea is we want to be able to compress it and still remain a plectonium. That's why we still have the scaling effect all the way up to to, to fusion conditions um, but that's that's a constraint that we that we work with 
a great answer, uh, Seth. I think uh, next up we have uh, Bill Lubin, and then uh, hopefully if we have time, we can get a question. I think Roman's the last one in the queue, so. Bill. Yeah, quick question, really interesting talk. Um, have you, you or you know, Los Alamos analyzed the instabilities you expect in the nozzle? I saw the ones outside, but in the nozzle. And then second question is, what is the, uh, the private sector interest in this? Is it space or is it uh, power or other? Um, so for the first part of the question, we, uh, we are not there yet in terms of looking at the stability inside the nozzle. That would definitely be a major, major uh, effort in, on our part. Um, there's the stability. That, so there's two aspects to that stability. There's a self-stability because these plasma jets that we formed um, are self-stabilized. They're a bit like a Z-pinch or a screw pinch uh, that is self-stable um, through the kink and sausage instabilities because of helical shear flows that are being generated. So that was experimentally observed, predicted, and, and it worked. Um, and we get these stable, stable uh, uh, jets that are radially balanced. Um, so there's got to be a, a, a self-pinch to compensate for the radio pressure balance. And that, that somehow is, is, is very stable. And as we add more current, basically the whole thing should uh, compress down just like a Z pinch, but effectively compress down to, to higher densities. Then when we add the extra uh, external fields, um, the impact now, the external fields are much slower than the alpha and time scale, much slower. So in principle, because the external field is reasonably symmetric because of the, of the coil designs, um, it should act effectively as a magnetic wall, magnetic flux conserver. So the plasma should be reasonably stable, but that remains to be seen um, and, and the simulations will start to inform. And then next year, once we get the first uh, plasmas, we'll be able to address that directly. Um, to get to your second part, a second question, um, the private interest we've seen has been um, uh, pretty pretty good actually. Um, uh, primarily, we, we've been aiming for the propulsion market um, precisely because compared to other companies and other concepts that address the energy market. So the energy market is huge. Everyone knows that it's the, the world's number one market. Um, and fusion would be a great answer for that. But there are many companies working on it. And all these companies to do fusion will need to get to very large gates before even commercializing, com being able to commercialize a concept. We flipped it around by saying that for a propulsion system, we design something for a propulsion system first, um, even at low gains, we can start selling an engine earlier, um, you know, compared to waiting until we get huge gains to be able to turn it into a power plant. Um, and the requirements are a little bit different, you know, and the advantages and disadvantages um, of putting it in space and doing it on Earth is a little bit different. Um, the, the, it, it taps in also into this fantastic um, uh, new space race that's happening right now. Um, and we want to be able to provide um, a potential solution for propulsion system you know, in the next decades to be able to say, hey, um, you know, a fusion propulsion system, we all know is the answer, whether it's ours or whether it's an inertial confinement system and so on, um, but let's work on it today, uh, get a minimum viable product up there um, and, and, and see where we go from there. You know, the first jet engines, um, you know, only lasted half an hour before they blew up basically, um, but it worked and it showed the promise and now we can cross across the ocean that way. So. Um, so people are very excited by that, and, and I think the private interest is, is just growing. Thank hey, Seth, thank, Seth, thank you for that uh, awesome comparison there, right? And re reminder of uh, previous technologies in terms of how they climbed the maturity uh, of the maturity hill, if you will. Uh, Roman, I'm going to have to apologize. I'm going to have to press on uh, a, a little bit. If 